Hi everyone, Jason here with PurpleSec, and as always, I'm joined by our very own Chief Product Officer, Josh Allen. How are you doing today, Josh? Doing all right. How are you, Jason? Hanging in there. It's a beautiful, gloomy Friday. Um, <laughs> nice here. <laughs> well, uh, move to Pennsylvania and you might have a different uh, attitude. Um, so we also have a very special guest here today, um, and he is by any definition a vulnerability management expert, cybersecurity whiz. Um, he's currently the director of cybersecurity for at and If you follow him on LinkedIn, then you probably know him as the unpopular opinion guy, although I don't think your opinions are that unpopular. Um, or you may have seen a, a picture of him with his, uh, his beard dyed pink for in support of uh, breast cancer awareness. I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, very pleased to have him here with us today, Joshua Copeland. How's it going? Going well, thanks for having me. It's also gloomy here in Louisiana, so <laughs> I feel you. Thanks for sharing in the misery. Um, and thank you for lending your expertise on this topic. We really do appreciate it. And I just want to take one more second uh, for our audience to really talk about your CV, because honestly, it's quite impressive um, and worth talking about. Um, you've been in the field for over 20 years. Um, uh, you have experience in cybersecurity. Um, you were uh, in the US Air Force for about 17 years. Um, working at, it seems like, all aspects of networking, admin, security, and moving your way up into the world. Um, you, and as a result of that, you've had the, uh, the ability to get exposure in just about every aspect of cybersecurity, holding positions as a security engineer, SOC manager, today in your current role as cybersecurity director. And uh, one fun fact we actually learned about you offline is that you actually hold 80 certifications, active certifications. I just have to ask, is that true and how? <laughs> uh, it is true. And I'm one of those really nerdy guys that likes to take certification exams just to see if I can pass. Um, so that's kind of, you know, my fun thing. You know, my kids liken it to collecting Pokemon. You know, you got to get them all. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, what, that fits for us too, because we're a bunch of nerds here. Um, so let's jump right into the conversation. We want to talk about the top 10 vulnerability management trends and predictions for 2023 and honestly beyond that. Um, really, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm just going to be moderating the conversation um, and just kind of moving us from topic to topic. I really want the focus to be on you guys, um, talking about from your perspective, your experience, um, your expertise. And the first trend that I'd really like to dive into and one that we've been talking about quite a bit at PurpleSec is automation of vulnerability management processes. And so many organizations are turning to these tools and processes to streamline their vulnerability management efforts, um, includes use of machine learning algorithms um, to identify and prioritize vulnerabilities, automating processes for patching or remediation, so much more. And Joshua, I wanna start off by throwing this question over to you. Is automation all that it's cracked up to be, or is it just vendors talking the talk? And where do you see automation evolving uh, you know, from here to support vulnerability management programs? Um, I think it's a bit of both. You know, There's absolute value in automation across the board, whether it's automating your scans, doing your discoveries, finding out what vulnerabilities you have, and then immediately switching that into the kind of reactive mode of automatically patching those devices. You know, Having a process that allows you to kind of automatically test your patching in a test environment and immediately roll that in once you've confirmed that it's good into your production environment. You know, some of us are, you know, everyone has a test environment. Some of us are lucky enough to have a production environment too. Um, that's kind of the way of the beast in a lot of places. So having the ability to kind of do a lot of those things automatically, you know, using automation, using, you know, all the tools that we have out there, using some AI stuff, machine learning, allows you to kind of just reduce your, you know, footprint that is exploitable. You know, we have all the hacks that have gone on and, you know, we'll talk like the Experian hack. The vulnerability that they used was months and months old. It was not, you know, a, you know, patch Tuesday, you know, exploit Wednesday scenario. It was a, you know, this was patch Tuesday six months ago <laughs> that it absolutely could have been patched, but, Really, they didn't have processes in place nor automation that says, this is what I have. These are my vulnerabilities, and this is the tool I'm going to use to, to fix that in a repeatable fashion. 
believe it or not, people still get hit with struts exploits yeah. today. Like they still have that vulnerability. Um, and you, you've really hit a key thing, right? It's like, how long are you vulnerable for? And a lot, I think a lot of organizations kind of, I don't know if they forget about it. I'm not really sure what it is that leads to these giant holes in, uh, you know, in, in their vulnerability management where they're months behind on updates that can be exploited. Um, I mean, I know before, you know, intelligence was a lot of thing. And I think one of the cool things about our automation tools and especially just the fact that our, you know, all of our people here really care about security and like to research it is uh, it's very quick with the information. Like we knew about Log4j the day it was released and we were able to deploy patches to our customers the day they were available uh, or at least alert them that there was something to patch, right? Um, so, you know, in your experience, what do you think leads to to that gap, right? Like we, we have the intelligence, the tools and the experts to identify problems as they happen. But then organizations seem to fail to react to them as quickly as we would all like them to. So I'm going to piggyback off of what you just talked about was Log4j. You know, it's now over a year later, and there's still a massive amount of exploitable Log4j out in the wild. And it's the real, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's been that long. <laughs> and kind of the thing that was really highlighted by Log4j was that organizations didn't realize they had it. Yeah. You know, it oh, was. Yeah embedded in you know three layers deep in their product line they don't know they have it you know organizations have largely done a really poor job at developing what their asset lists are you know what are my critical applications what are my critical hardware pieces what are my critical software where are they and where does that kind of define what my vulnerability is i can have the same vulnerability that's a you know cve that's rated as a critical and if that's on my perimeter edge on a web server, that's a different level of vulnerability than sitting on a air gap system inside my network that you have to have physical access to get to. I'm like, yes, they're both ranked as a critical, but which one do I really need to pay attention to? And that requires you to understand what you have, where it's at, and what business processes are tied to that. So kind of having that matrix is what a lot of organizations just are really weak on. You know, they do basic asset-based discovery scans. You know, I did Tenable for loads of years. I've used Qualys and some of the other tools. And if you're doing asset list discovery and scanning, you're missing, you know, half your network. You know, you've got shadow IT. You have stuff that, you know, you don't necessarily realize that on your network. You know, all of the OT, IoT things that are kind of there that creep on over time that if you're not doing true you know, full IP space discovery scans that take forever, you know, you're going to have these gaps in knowledge and those gaps in knowledge create massive amounts of vulnerabilities. So that right there is what we aim to close with automation, right? Mean time to remediation is something that we've talked about before, Jason and I have, you know, that's kind of your, that's the measure of that gap, right? Like we know there's a vulnerability. How quickly can you remediate it? Because here's a very real statistic is it takes on average less than a day for vulnerabilities to be weaponized upon discovery um, and and to be deployed, especially now with like botnets as a service, you can weaponize and deploy something the day that it's, it's dropped on, you know, on zero day or day plus one. Um, so now, you know, there was, that's going up against these organizations like Experian, who took months to patch something. And, you know, they're obviously a lot better today, but even even being a month behind is still too long. Uh, if if they can weaponize things in hours, you know, we have to start thinking about closing those gaps within days and weeks now, not not months. Yeah, And, and I think we, a lot of orgs still do monthly. Yeah, and when you really factor in the factor of Mean time to detection currently is seven months. Is it really? Wow. wow. That's that bad. <laughs> it, it is, is that it... bad. So how is that they... possible? <laughs> well, you have no patching, you know, not necessarily have your SOC related tools set up to identify those things. You know, they could be going in and doing kind of those very stealth level actions that, right. you know, you aren't going to ping because you have a large amount of data flowing out. They're just moving laterally throughout your network. So the stat is seven months. You know, that's huge. If they weaponize day two and you're seven months 
before you even detect it. That's like even with a a fairly robust patching schedule where you know you're patching once a month, they're in your network for at least a month at the minimum before you actually do anything to prevent them from being there. And typically you're not going to know that they're there for several months after that. Right. The stealth's getting better. And if it's something like an APT, I mean, then, then we're talking, you may never discover it until, you know, your data is ransomed. Another thing you mentioned earlier was, you know, the, the criticality of these vulnerabilities and something that I've been noticing and been trying to change is the fact that, you know, criticality is, is, one of like the top three statistics or, or metrics right now that people are looking at when they're talking about vulnerability management. Um, and you mentioned it, the risk to the organization, the, the risk-based approach um, is something that I really like because I don't really think the critical rating matters. Like for example, here's a penetration test I did, right? Uh, they had a, a level 1.0, uh, a low, right? It was SMB message signing is disabled. Now, we here probably already know where this story is going to end and probably a lot of people listening do too, but we were able to take that low level vulnerability, combine that with a medium SMB endpoint, you know, no validation. Uh, and then in this environment, there was no EPP or EDR to prevent writing malicious payloads to the disk, right? Um, and then we were able to do some super low level snooping, found some remote control channels, validate some local credentials, but then combined all that together. And, and at the end of this, you know, I was able to hook malware into their Active Directory, connect back to our test C2 server and, you know, make a ping and then send a, a dummy file back the other way. So, you know, this is a ransomware is what happened. So organizations who are focused on this, oh, well, you know, that's a low vulnerability. We don't need to patch that for another nine months, right? Well, that's fun tools for people like me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's one of those things where if you kind of follow what is kind of the DOD methodology where you're supposed to patch criticals within 15 days, high within 30, you know, mediums within, you know, six months, mm -hmm. you know, so on and so forth. You end up getting a lot of these really exploitable, you know, mediums and lows that by themselves aren't terribly bad, but when you have enough of them, you can leverage them against each other. And then one of the really kind of interesting things that uh, attackers are using now, particularly for ransomware, is using legitimate tools that already exist on the box. You know, things like AnyDesk, where, you know, you already have this remote access software sitting on your desk, or they're deploying legitimate remote access software that your Bomb EDRs, <laughs> XDRs aren't gonna flag as you know, naughty and something that is going to be blocked. They're going to say, no, this is legitimately this software. Go ahead and install it. And now I've used all these kind of small kind of innocuous vulnerabilities to now get a legitimate foothold in a network where I have the ability to kind of just spread everywhere I want. Remind me what part of the DOD you, you worked in the DOD, right? Yeah, Previously? I did. Okay. I was Air Force for 20 years. Okay, cool. Uh, I was Air Force for a short while too. Uh, so when I was working at DISA, I mean, it, we had that same thing, right? I mean, we're talking about the, oh man, I can't remember what the acronym for that is, right? The 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 patching timeframes. And I think a lot of businesses try to kind of emulate that, right? They're like, well, we we got to get criticals right away and lows this time. And, I, and, and the huge difference between commercials, uh, commercial infrastructure and like the, you know, the defense infrastructure, you know, I mean, how think about all the other compensating controls that are in place that the DOD has, you know, like uh, patching is one part of what they're doing, right? And they have all these other like highly, I mean, they're controlling their supply chain. Okay. People like SolarWinds are not controlling their supply chain. We know that very well. Uh, nobody's really doing that. So, you know, in, in almost in contrast, I like to do things the DOD way, but you know, what, what is your opinion on kind of contrasting that? Because I think organizations aren't able to just follow these long time frames and be safe or be low risk because they don't have any other compensating controls. In play. They're only doing patching, right? If that's all you're doing, that can't be enough. Yeah, it, that comes down to you have to, one, understand what your risk are, and then, two, understand what your risk acceptance level is. You know, 
what are my critical things? These are my systems that generate my money. They're the things that I can't have fail versus the things that kind of don't matter as much. You know, does it matter if my guest network in my office building, you know, gets taken over? Yep. Yes, but no, <laughs> especially if you have good controls and that's a completely segmented network. So, yeah, that's bad, but it's not affecting my business. So my priority should be fixing, you know, the mediums and low on my business side, not taking care of the critical vulnerability I have on the, the guest network. You know, kind of understanding where those things are and, you know, what your layers of protections are. You know, obviously, I want to take care of those things that are on my perimeter, on my edge, the things that have public facing IP addresses first, because, you know, if you're using Shodan or census, you know, they're getting hit all the time. They're being enumerated. You know, you can go out and find all this stuff readily available, no special hacker skills required. And it'll tell you there's this server with this IP address with these vulnerabilities running these ports and services. Here it is. Here's the silver platter. Let me go find my, you know, Metasploit disk and figure out which one of these built-in tools I can just click a button. You're making us look old, man. Don't talk about disks. <laughs> <laughs> so no, there's, right, there's, a, there's a lot of good conversation going on here, but I, I want to kind of segue into another topic here that I think aligns with what you guys are talking about, and that's really, you know, the solution to some of this. So we've, we've talked quite a bit about um, how automation kind of solves some things and how, uh, Josh, you even mentioned risk-based um, vulnerability management, gave a really good example there. Um, what I'd like to focus on, because this is something that I struggle with with engaging with some of our prospects and our clients, um, is around continuous monitoring. So, you know, it, regularly scanning systems and networks um, for any type of issues that might come up. A lot of the times um, we get clients that say, yeah, I do a quarterly vulnerability assessment. And I'm like, so you're not, you're wasting money? Like that that's really the conversation there. So, um, you know, and, and really where ideally you want to get to is daily or weekly uh, scanning and patching cycles. Um, so, Josh, over to you. What do you think is the main driver for organizations to adapt uh, continuous monitoring and why aren't they doing it already? It seems so obvious. You know, it's kind of funny. I, I literally just had a client conversation before we got on this uh, t discussing our continuous uh, patching and monitoring solution for them. Uh, so it was it was a new um, it was a new uh, high ranking guy coming in, right? Like trying to figure out the lay of the land. Right. And so he goes, well, he goes, so when <laughs> he goes, when is your project going to be done? I said, you mean vulnerability management? He goes, yeah, I said. Vulnerability management's never done. That's an ongoing <laughs> process. And then he kind of laughed at me and he goes, says the guy getting paid every month, right? So, um, I mean, budget, first of all, nobody wants to pay us every month to do this stuff. Um, and, and oddly enough, you know, I've got that question uh, with almost every single vulnerability management client engagement I have ever had in my career is they ask me, when will it be done? Um, you know, and it's, I'm like a robot. I'm like, that doesn't compute. I don't know what you're asking me, you know? Um, so I uh, I have seen a lot more organizations, especially mature organizations who are really serious about cybersecurity, moving over to continuous monitoring at the very least, uh, continuous you know continuous updating, continuous patching, and continuous fixes of the security still lags greatly behind what we would like it to be. Um, but monitoring is certainly catching on, especially with MDR and things. And um, you know that's that's a hugely important part, though. Anyway, right? Um, Joshua here already mentioned it. He goes, you know, people aren't seeing stuff for seven months, right? So having continuous monitoring on top of just vulnerability scanning, you know, not just scanning whenever you can scan, but actually having like an MDR service looking at at you, you know, an, an IR or or a SOC actually actively monitoring what's happening, not just what's being installed, but what are your systems doing? Um, and then we have things like application performance monitoring, which is some people say it's great other people say it sucks uh you know draw your own conclusions but it does it does monitor get what the applications are doing and, and that has a lot more security implications so i think a big part that is improving is visibility uh, visibility is is great visibility is probably the most important thing because without that you can't do anything else now i'm curious if there's an unpopular opinion <laughs> on what i just said <laughs> well yeah so if you've dealt with anything with federal, DOD, um, even now a lot of states, 
continuous monitoring isn't just a good idea. It's a requirement. Correct. Um, but you have to understand what you're actually monitoring. Uh, am I just doing continuous monitoring, generating a report and filing it away? Or am I doing something that creates actionable items that I'm actually doing the thing to remediate with? Am I just generating a report to have an artifact for my ATO? Or am I generating a report that I'm then in turn prioritizing based off of my risk, what my risk acceptance and what my risk tolerance are, and figuring out, you know, am I going to be able to do this? Is it a matter of that I have this legacy application that has to run on this specific version of Java because that happens everywhere? And I accept that risk, but now I've documented that I've accepted the risk, and these are the mitigating controls I put around that risk, and now that's documented that I know that it's there, not that it's just something that's in my environment. That, that last part doesn't happen. <laughs> the documentation that you're talking about? Um, I mean, good organizations do it, right? But I'm, uh, you know, th this client I was just talking to, um, something that we've been trying to get them on is like, hey, how much risk have you accepted in your organization? I'm like, huh? Right? Like, what does that I, mean? <laughs> I can't tell you the number of clients I've gone into and said, can I have a network diagram? And they go, what's that? Yeah. And I go, oh, yeah. how are All you doing your scanning? How are you doing your patching? Guessing. We just let. Windows update itself. Uh, yeah. Yep. Hear those stories all the time. So moving on to the next trend here that we're taking a look at is around cloud security. So maybe a little buzzy, but um, I think more organizations are adopting cloud-based solutions. Um, you know, there's a real need to have effective um, vulnerability management uh, for cloud systems, and it's only going to continue to grow. Um, you know, as we're continuing to use uh, containerization technologies like Docker, Kubernetes. Um, so open question, anyone who wants to take this one. Um, where do you see the biz biggest issues or lack in cloud security as it relates to vulnerability management today? And what can be done to help fix it? I'll go first. Um, one of the issues that I see most with cloud security is the ability that you can rapidly provision devices that are not documented anywhere in your system, they're not in your CMDB, they're not an IP space that you have set up to scan, they're not you know, necessarily programmed to go through all your defensive measures, your IDSs, your firewalls. So you now you're bringing all these systems online that are largely images off of whatever platform that you're using whether it's AWS, GCP or Azure, and that's a, you know, vanilla, you know, Windows 2016 server that hasn't been patched that you spin up and now is sitting in your enclave and you have nothing that's telling you that, hey, you need to patch this. There's nothing that's forcing you to do that. And there's nothing alerting you that, hey, there's this new device in your environment. What am I supposed to do with it? Fix it. Yeah, seen it, hate it. Um, you know, and, and this is the kind of thing that really frustrates me because uh, the problem, the, the same thing that creates a problem also can create a great solution, right? You can rapidly provision stuff that's all jacked up, or you could rapidly provision stuff that's, you know, got a proper cloud formation template and AMI that you've pre built that's hardened. You know, all your UNC paths are hardened. You've got your scanning agent already on it. You've got your VPN clients already on it, you know, and it's, it's plug and play. Um, and people just don't do that. Um, you know, and they give all kinds of reasons why. And people say it's too hard. And I just, I say no. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's not that it's hard. It takes time and money. Yeah. And this has been a problem in IT cybersecurity since inception is we build things that work. Yeah. We don't build things that are secure from the start. Security tends to be that afterthought of, oh, now I have this thing that works. Now what do I do? You know, right. OT and IoT are great examples. We have, you know, all these great devices that allow you to have doorbell cameras and control your house and turn light bulbs on at a specific time. And, you know, you can be like, you know, 
Surrey intruder alert and lights go red and play as welcome to the jungle. But what have you done to actually make sure that those things are not vulnerable, that you've protected the things that are critical, you know, the laptop that has all your banking information on from the power strip that is got a smart capability that is totally breachable and has been demonstrated to be able to access that and then jump into your actual proper network. How are we taking these things that are super useful and then building protection around them? And are we even doing that? You know, when's the last time someone, you know, updated the firmware on their TV? Uh, last time it was available. <laughs> you, right. you're a security person. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a dirty mop, right? Um, you can't clean your floors with a dirty mop. You have to clean your mop. And a lot of times security is a dirty mop. Um, people have a lot of security stuff and it's not taking care of itself uh, or it's made by solar winds. I'm sorry. I'm going to keep, I'm not going to keep bashing on them. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm going to keep bashing on them. Um, you know, cause it's just so, so Stuff like that sometimes is just, you know, kind of almost embarrassing. It's like, how do you get hit with that kind of thing? And it's 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 because it, they have a dirty mop. You know, their floors have been messy the whole time. Um, it's pretty bad. I, I think technical debt, right? I mean, you're right. We build stuff that works, right? I mean, how it's, it's taken like 10 to 15 years to get SEC as part of DevOps, and they put it in the middle instead of the beginning, right? They didn't even shift all the way left. It's DevSecOps, right? Nobody wants to say SEC DevOps. <laughs> um, yeah, get on Twitter, and you can start some great arguments with that one there. Uh, but that's the reality of it, right? It's like if if you're not if you're not thinking about it from the beginning, you have technical debt. And people say, well, it's too expensive. It, it increases step one of the development life cycle, right? It makes it more expensive at the entry price. It's like, sure, but if you don't spend that money up front, you're going to end up spending significantly more money down the road fixing the problem or paying the ransom so you can have your stuff back. Well, and then you have to even look at it from the perspective of people sh chase the shiny new tool. Hmm. And it's super common. It's, Here's the new latest, greatest you know, technology that does this thing. And then you actually look at that organization's security stack and go, you already have three things that do that. <laughs> you don't have them configured. You're not using them. You know, we're not doing the fundamentals well. We're just chasing whatever the new cool shiny tech is then hoping that that's going to make up for us just not doing things the right way from the beginning. Yeah, that gets expensive and sales moment here, but that's something we're going to help. We help our clients with too, is, is we use our automation to compact things and say, Hey, you know, you've got eight licenses to do scanning and patching. How about one monthly fee? Right. Um, plus then nobody has to manage all that stuff too. Uh, and the same thing, you know, I, I can't tell you how many pen tests I've done where the security was pretty good everywhere else. Uh, but then I hacked into the antivirus server. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I can turn that off. So now it doesn't matter. Um, dirty mops. Well, one of the things when I did kind of the red team stuff, I would immediately target AV servers, scanning servers, and domain controllers. You know, yep. any of those three gives me the keys to the kingdom. Game over, step one. I love it. Mm -hmm. So All right, Jason, what else do you want to talk about? Well, we got a lot to talk <laughs> about here, and it's a great conversation. So I, I want to talk a little bit about threat intelligence. Um, and there's a lot of organizations that are turning to threat intel platforms and services to stay up to date with the latest vulnerabilities and trends. Um, Joshua, over to you. What is, Why is this something that companies should be focusing on? And what is the greatest gap that exists today as it relates to threat intelligence within that so, framework of vulnerability management? So first things first, you know, threat intelligence is important because that's how you know what's being targeted. You know, that's how you set up all your alerts in your SIM. That's how you develop your SOAR capabilities. You know, that's what you set as your triggers for your IDS, IPS. So without that, you have a cool tool that's doing essentially nothing. You know, it's looking for all the basic things that aren't necessarily targeted. Um, one of the important things is to look at the things that are targeted toward your particular industry. You know, I work largely with, you know, state and local government. So I'm absolutely a member of the MS ISAC for the multi-state 
you know, agencies where we're given through information sharing from every you know state level organization, you know, that data that is targeting specifically our stuff. If you're in the FinSec or FinTech sector, you know, they have a ISAC that's targeted towards that. You know, if they go after your near peer at Bank X, well, you can probably take a good guess that they're going to go after every other bank eventually in that same sector using the same type of attacks because you're using the same type of technologies. You have the same regulations. You have the same kind of security stacks built around protecting your things. So having specific threat intelligence related to your sector allows you to better understand what's going on. And then potentially, you know, it might not help you at that time, but if you're doing the information sharing, you know, protect your neighbor who hopefully will do the same to help protect you. Any other thoughts on that, Josh? No, I'm just thinking about hackers and like, you know, it's, it's he, Joshua, you mentioned something earlier about, you know, loading up your, your Metasploit disc, but um, it, it, in the same vein, right? Like it, what works is what will keep being used, right? If the hackers invent all kinds of new tools all the time, uh, but time and time again, we're still seeing companies and organizations fall to really old stuff. I mean, they're just, just last year, somebody got eternal blued and that thing is a decade old uh, or, or more. I mean, you know, and, and what do we do to prevent stuff like that? Like, you know, my, my own opinion, and, and I, I tend to be pretty harsh about stuff like this, but, you know, if if you're insured and you're a business with any kind of insurance against, you know, loss of business due to those attacks, and it's something that's a decade old, uh, I'm not going to pay you. Because to me, that says you're not doing your due diligence. And a, a big problem I have is that people will always make the argument of, well, we have these legacy systems. Well, you know, that's not really an excuse that I think is acceptable in the 2020s. Uh, you know, this post-COVID world stuff is nasty. Oh, and hey, by the way, they just released a really cool AI that people have already figured out how to get it to write really good weaponized stuff. You know, it's it's not supposed to let you write malware, but people have gotten it to write malware. There's now a service you can go online and pay them to write malware for you, right? They've already turned that into a business. The thing's been out like a month. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about that kind of weapon against businesses that continuously refuse to update things because of legacy. And they're going to start really feeling the pain that they, you know, we think things have been bad now, and I think they're going to get a lot worse for these legacy system holders. And security needs to no longer just be patching things and making risk acceptances for old stuff that you need to get make the business running. Security needs to be figure out how to make our business critical things robust enough to not be hacked, especially by things that are a decade old. Um, I mean, it's just silly that that. <laughs> I, I get very passionate about that kind of issue. It's just, you know, there's some really, you know, people go and learn and, and we've learned all these really cool new ways of doing something. I'm like, but then again, I go do a pen test and, you know, I can pop SMB, I can get Eternal Blue, I can get really basic, boring stuff that a 12 year old could, you know, click go on. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, you can... <laughs> and to your point, um, with the cyber insurance brokers, they're now actively going after organizations for not doing due diligence. There was a lawsuit from, I believe it was Travelers, who had insured an organization who attested that they had multi-factor authentication. And they did. They had multi-factor authentication enabled, but it wasn't enforced. So Travelers went, well- We turned it on. <laughs> you, you misrepresented your security posture, so we don't want to pay. Yeah, And that's what you're going to see a lot of. And then you're going to see now cybersecurity insurance, you know, when it came out, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, brokers were just writing policies. They had no idea what they were doing. Right. You know, they've had plenty of time to build up actuary tables to figure out, oh, if I'm going to insure you, I want to see your SOC 2 type 2 audit. Yeah, they're you're going to have to provide that to me before <laughs> I will give you the policy. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of crazy that that wasn't how it was to begin with, because any other insurance, you know, think about all the stuff you have to provide to get just car insurance, homeowners insurance, uh, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, having old critical vulnerabilities because of legacy systems should be akin to, you know, arson on your own home. It's, you know that that's fraud maybe that's a little bit harsh but i mean it's it's borderline <laughs> it's it's almost negligent fraud at that point you know to to just not fix your stuff it's just crazy to me yeah we 
we frequently talk to people um, who are trying to get some type of cybersecurity insurance, and they're like, well, I, I think I just need to do security policies, and I'm good. I'm like, uh, maybe 10 years ago, like you guys are talking about. Um, and you're right, it's a business. Those guys want to make money. They're not going to insure people um, who aren't doing things right. So another uh, area that I'd like to talk about real quick, and, and this again seems like a very obvious one for me, but maybe it's just, maybe I'm just in this world a little bit, but enhanced focus on network segmentation um, to really help limit the scope of a vulnerability and reduce the potential impact of an exploit. Open question here, you know, first of all, what is a network segmentation and why aren't organizations more readily adapting this best practice? I mean, it seems best practice. Well, it's, um, it's it's network work, which you know uh, nobody ever wants to do network work. Not even you know the network guys. Uh, it it does require a little bit of complexity. And it does introduce complexity into the organization, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, complexity can actually really help here. And and let's talk about real quick what is network segmentation for people is, who are listening who who you know maybe don't know. But we're talking about you know, making things on separate subnets or even in some cases entirely separate physical networks from other systems. And the entire goal here is to prevent, you know, uh, cross network travel so that you can't go laterally. You don't want to have a big flat network so that some guy, you know, sitting here in Houston can hack in and turn off your cement factory in Sweden or something like that, right? You want those things to be segmented. Um, and now, especially if you have customer data, critical data, you know, whatever system and network is connected to the internet access point if it's you know just logging in right as long as that's not where the business is you really don't want that to be connected to your databases in the back end with customer data you definitely don't want someone to be able to hack into that and and break or steal those things um, network segmentation is becoming required with more things pci requires that your actual network where the payment cards are swiped and processed through be separate from other networks that has to be its, its own network and um there's a few others that are starting to require it, but uh, you know, to answer, one part of the the answer to why is it not heavily readily adopted, uh, other than the complexity and the cost of that, is because it's not really required, and businesses typically aren't going to do security that isn't required because you know it's just seen as a cost for no reason, right? Um, now, I always argue that the reason is well, you know when you become a ransomware victim you'll 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 wish you had spent the investment on that right um yeah i mean it's it's really that it's it's com cost complexity and there's just not a lot of requirements yet you know other than pci and, and a few other basic ones out there uh it's a very intelligent thing to do though um you know that that cement factory example I gave is a little bit based off of a real world example I had working inside of an organization, you know, and I, talked I was going to ask, that was very specific. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it was one of those instances where, you know, I told my boss, I was like, Hey, you know, if, if, if I was a malicious user or I had just recently clicked a phishing email and installed malware on my system, uh, we could have a real problem here. You know, we could turn off the manufacturing all across the globe for the, I mean, if that's what we're doing, that's literally millions of dollars an hour that, of damage that mm -hmm. can be done. And that right there is why you segment your network. I shouldn't have been able to access that ever. I have no need to access that system. And to your point, we have an issue where there is a perception, particularly among the business side of the organizations, that compliance is security. Mm -hmm. And compliance is not security. They are not the same. Compliance is literally the very bare minimum jumping off point you have for security. Why well, is you know, compliance? <laughs> yeah, like it takes too long to build compliance requirements. If they're codified in a law, whether it's, you know, PCI, uh, HIPAA, FISMA, FedRAMP, you know, RMF, that's a long, laborious process to get that codified. By the time that that gets codified, you're talking it's you know two three years from that type of vulnerability being a thing so you kind of have to look at it from the perspective of yes network segmentation is absolutely the right thing you should do because it's just smart but it can be expensive it introduces complexity and a lot of places just weren't built with it from the ground up you have these organizations that have been around for 30 plus years and their network is all completely flat and every device in the network has a public facing IP address. Why are you doing these things? 
like because that's the way it was set up 30 years ago and no one's put the time or money into it because the cybersecurity person hasn't made the right business case of why you need to do that. And that's kind of where we fail as cybersecurity personnel is we don't really do a great job at making business cases of why you need to do security. Mm -hmm. We go, you need to do security because security. <laughs> no, you need to do security because if this server is down, now you're losing, you know, a hundred K every hour that it's down. That makes more sense to the business person who goes, okay, that makes sense. If I tell them that I need, you know, five nines for a server, that means nothing to them. It doesn't matter how long the server's up. What matters to them is when the server is down, they're not making this much money. And that's where you kind of have to make that transition, especially when you get in those cybersecurity leadership roles of translating security into business and vice versa. Yeah, That's now we're talking task. about our our favorite acronym over here, ROSI, Return on Security Investment. I mean, in at the bottom line, what we're talking about here is money. We're talking about money. Money is always, uh, it's the root of everything here. I mean, we have cybersecurity to protect money, and it costs money, and then, you know, money goes this way and that way. So I think you're right. You know, that business case, when we're talking about talking to the business, I mean, what is this, what's the reason for security? Well, it's it's your money. I mean, it's the same reason you lock your house, right? You don't want to get robbed. You don't want people to take your valuables. And in this case, when our, our valuables, we're talking about blueprints, uh, IP, customer data, uh, or even just your brand, right? If people can take that from you, then you're losing money. And investing in security is just like investing in a safe. Um, and I like to, you know, I, I like to think about this too and, and talk about people, you know, we think about, okay, when you leave home in the morning, you lock your door. You know, we don't leave home anymore. But if when you left home in the morning, you know, you lock your door, you set your alarm, all your windows are closed and locked. You probably have, you know, a dog and, you know, maybe a gun. Who knows what else you have, right? You lock your car. It's got an alarm. It's got a GPS tracking system in it. Uh, and then you get to work and you build a brand new multi-billion dollar thing and you leave the blueprint up and you walk away from your computer without locking it. And by the way, that thing's backed up to a public facing system, right? It's like, it's just a complete disconnect from what we do in our everyday lives. And I think part of that's just, you know, computers are newer than cars and houses are, but I think if we treated it a lot more like our, our home security is almost like without a second thought, right? It's just like a background thought. Like that's when security is truly going to start making the turn around the corner of being being less of a uh, an arms race with the hackers and just being more about, you know, being diligent. You brought up something really interesting that I, I read about earlier this week. It was talking about how uh, newer generations that are growing up, they they know how to use a tablet and a phone, but they're mm -hmm. computer illiterate. And I think by virtue of having that phone in front of you, because they know how to operate this, right? But they don't know how to go point and click on a mouse and you know troubleshoot on their own. They need a lot of help. It makes me wonder if that computer illiteracy, one, if it's true, um, and then two, how would that trickle down into the newer workforces that are coming? Um, you know, are they going to be able to think about security in that mind as well? So lots of really good topics there uh, to, mm -hmm. that we could dive into uh, maybe another time. Got a few more uh, that I'd like to go through here. Um, and and this is one that you touched upon earlier, Josh, was the DevSecOps um, or SecDevOps. <laughs> um, so obviously it's growing movement, it's gaining a lot of traction um, as a way to improve security um, posture for a lot of organizations. Um, can you explain, Josh, what DevSecOps hopes to accomplish and why you think vendors aren't really taking software security as seriously as they should be? I know you talked a little bit about technical yeah. debt, but. Yeah, so, you know, DevSecOps is really baking security in from the, the beginning or beginning-ish of the product. Um, the previous model was I build a thing, it works, I get it to market, and then when we find security related things will throw a patch or a hot fix on it. DevSecOps kind of looks at that and goes, no, I want to build a secure product from the beginning. Yes, we understand that there's always going to find new vulnerabilities and things that might get exploited later, but we want to kind of take it from the ground up and have a security first mindset. You know, understand that I need to have my data separated. I need to have these functions done in such a way that I can't cross 
flow and elevate privileges, things of that nature. So when you have a lot of these applications that came out before you know the last five years or so, it was really just get it to market, get it to where it works. And now there's a lot of organizations that are going, no, no, if my product gets it causes a breach, I lose revenue. So they've taken it as kind of a piece of ownership to go, I need to have security built in from the beginning. And now it's become a selling point that you use that DevSecOps process because now I have as a buyer, you know, a little more confidence that your product is at least trying to be secure from the beginning. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about the one that everyone hates, Sec DevOps. Um and this is the one I love. And and there's kind of a di the, the reason there's this love hate dichotomy right now is is um I think two reasons. One, there's a, a fundamental it's either a misunderstanding, um, or or people are, are you know intentionally being misleading with how difficult sec devops is. Sec devops is a lot more like the DOD type of security culture uh that you know we've talked about. Sec DevOps is something where it's security first, meaning that Everybody who's involved in development in this case, and uh, I like to use DevOps f f just as an example for pretty much any kind of operational thing, right? It doesn't have to necessarily be application development. It can also be like literally making things, right? Like building tanks and crap like that for the DOD. So at any point of operations, right? Everybody's thinking about the security of the operations that they're doing. That's sec DevOps, which means before you even start building a thing, you're thinking about, have I talked about my job? Did I make sure I'm badging in? You know, did I scan my retina? Is my credentials up to date? Am I locking my system? You know, is everything all in order? And then I start working on the stuff. Now, where this hate comes from is, you know, there's a ton of articles out there that uh, it makes this sound like a, a ridiculous task, right? Like it's kind of a complaint of, well, everybody has to become a security expert now and we're developers, not security experts, you know, blah, blah is what I say. Everybody can think about security. You think about the security of your house, your car, you do, you know, actually you don't think about it. You've practiced it so well that it's not something you really have to think about anymore, right? Um, <clears throat> and there isn't that practice with cybersecurity today. So people are having to actively think about it and that does make it harder to adopt, right? If at every second you have to stop what you're doing and think about security, you're not going to want to do the security. That's going to make you mad because you went to college to build software. Um, however, if if you as an organization can turn into sec DevOps where people are thinking about security first, that means that, you know, rather than going, ah, oh, did I make sure I did this security step? What you're what you're doing is you're sitting down going, okay, I'm building this application. And I'm building these input classes and we have a control function for accessing the database, you know, before I think about making sure I can access it, let me think about, you know, the OWASP top 10 type of attacks and make sure that there's secure authentication back to that, that I've sanitized my inputs, which is really basic stuff everyone should be doing, right? And, you know, a, a good secure developer will know a lot more stuff than that, but not building these things that can be exploited into the application. So it is really hard. Um, it's not something that you can do simply by saying you should, you know, increase the security of your applications or by implementing tools or by anything else. This is purely a people problem, right? Um, and there aren't very good KPIs for it. Right? Like, how do you measure how security conscious your employees are? Uh, well, they didn't click the phishing email, I guess. It's a good one. Um, you know, so I think that's something that <clears throat> as much as I love it and, and wish everyone did it like the Department of Defense and, and other really good, uh, you know, high security organizations did. The fact of the matter is you can't make that change without, you know, actually making a cultural change within your organization about how you treat your your security and your data. Uh, it's not impossible, though. Don't, don't, don't take that the wrong way. It needs to be done. It just needs money, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... I, I don't know that it necessarily needs to be more expensive money-wise. I mean, it's it's about just utilizing the money you have differently, right? Like people, we already put people through training. People have to go through the same training. We have yearly annual, you know, ethics training, the cybersecurity basic training everyone has to do, blah, 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 all that stuff, right? So those trainings suck, first of all. And if we made those better, the better, those that training better, you know, that's one really big way 
that will help. Uh, another good way, uh, you know, and I know we're, we're kind of coming up on our time here, but uh, OK, we just recently talked about this breach uh, is at the Baltimore school system where a teacher got a phishing email, thought it was suspicious, sent it to the IT help desk. The IT help desk guy goes, oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is something bad. We didn't send it, sent it over to the information security guy, and uh, he opened it not in the sandbox because he thought it was fine. He's like, oh, yeah, here, let me just open this ransomware the entire school system. Uh, that guy probably works somewhere else right now. Uh, and I'm not saying that guy got fired from there. What I'm saying is somebody hired that guy. Okay. In the DOD, man, if you leak secret data, you're probably not working up for with secret data ever again in your lifetime. Um, and it's harsh, but I mean, that's a reality that keeps people in check. Mm -hmm. Iron fist. Good points. <laughs> Good points. Um, let's shift over to uh, briefly talk about some of the vulnerability assessment tools out there um, and really just open floor here. Um, you know, what are some of the tools that are coming out that that in your mind are doing things differently that are really pushing the envelope and are actually working the way salespeople say they, that they work? Is there anything that comes to mind? Maybe, maybe not a specific tool, but you know, more generalized technology. Um, I think the ones that I find the most interesting are the agent-based tools where they're doing continuous scanning. It's not a you know point in time, I scanned you today, or you have to be on the network at this point in time for that to kick off, but it resides on the box and does you know that periodic you know every hour every you know six hours whatever the criteria is and then does the reporting back that automatically kicks off that patching product to go ahead and remediate that right away you know that way you're not relying on patching windows and you're not you know putting in inordinate amounts of time trying to make sure all your systems are online during this window because that's your scanning window you know when you go agent based, you're definitely cutting down on the missed opportunities. Yeah, so that MTTR we're talking about. Um, yeah, I, I like the agent based stuff. I mean, it does come with the caveat that, you know, it, it, it can eat up resources and, and some vendors, their agents are really, really greedy. Um, and, you know, and, and that is the thing, if you're going to be a customer of somebody who has agent based software, definitely make sure you ask them about how many resources, how much, you know, does it use? Uh, you know, anything around 10%, up to 10%, like if you, if if it's maxed out and doing what it's doing, it's using 10% of the endpoints resources, that's not bad, really. That's that's pretty decent. Um, but, you know, like I've messed around with Elastic and if you turn too much stuff on and you don't optimize it, like it'll eat up half of your RAM on an eight gig, you know, laptop really quickly, which is a terrible user experience. Um, but I do like those systems. And, you know, I'm hoping to see that technology get a little bit better. Uh, maybe if they can even do some kind of like agentless process that can be deployed to other systems. I mean, that'd be really cool. You know, APM right now <clears throat> is kind of like that. You, you sort of program an agent into your application <clears throat> right and the application itself during its normal functions reports back to your monitoring system so you know rather than it being a an additional software it's literally just built into the platform um, and that would be a really cool thing to see in the future too you know you get a laptop and you, you don't install an antivirus like it's built into the cpu practically Machine see code. all i want to do is i want to put on a quest headset and i just want to Kind of like minority report. <laughs> this vulnerability over here, this vulnerability over there. Go out of it. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Hey, Show you can live that. out your your legless dreams in the metaverse, sir. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I have two more topics I want to I want to cover real quickly here, um, and then we can can sign off. Uh, first, uh, integration of incident response into the vulnerability management process. Um, what do we mean by integration and how does this improve the overall security? Again, uh, open question, whoever wants to dive into that one. So I'll dive in a little first. You know, when you have identified vulnerabilities, that should automatically be put over to whoever's, you know, your watcher of people, your SOC, your incident response folks, because that's critical information they need to know because that kind of can tailor what they're looking at. When you look at it and go, 
well, I know I have these exploitable vulnerabilities in my network that haven't been remediated yet. I need to put a little bit extra attention on those because that is no kidding a vector into my environment. And it allows me to create rules and you know ability to create alerts based around that that makes it to where now I shorten that mean time to detection. Yeah, and there are some security companies out there, you know, especially these MDR companies who, you know, MDR was kind of brought out to address exactly what Joshua was talking about here is is bridging that gap, gap right, is, uh, you know, they probably have scanning in place, uh, but they don't have anybody looking at, you know, has anyone ever exploited that vulnerability in the past, right? And that's where incident response and MDR kind of came into play. But there are companies now um, who offer that solution together, right? So they do... They do the monitoring and they also have scanning, you know, just together is, is almost like a you know, kind of an obvious package to have. And so what that turns into the integration here is is you're you're essentially turning your scanning into signatures, right? So you're you're getting the same signatures for the scanner as you are for your incident analysis tools. And so at the same time that you're checking to see if the vulnerabilities are there, you also have analysts in a SOC looking to see if you see IOCs of these vulnerabilities, right? This is both sides of it, right? Uh, IOCs tell you you've got the vulnerability because it's sometimes, I mean, you may even see IOCs without your scanner showing you that you have a vulnerability, which probably means your scanner is misconfigured in some way. Um, and how could you possibly know that without the visibility? Visibility, man, that's that's such a big important thing. Yeah, it's a theme for sure coming up. Um, Last topic we have here to discuss, and I think Joshua, you had added this one, um, talking about software bill of materials, and you had referenced Log4j. Uh, what can you tell us about SBMO and its impact on vulnerability management? Well, it, Log4j is, is the actual you know textbook example of software that's embedded inside of your software, that's inside, embedded inside of your hardware, that you don't really understand that you have this software that needs to be patched. You don't really get the uh, concept that there are things that need to be drawn attention to because you don't understand that they're in your network. If I don't know that it's there, I can't actively monitor or track it. So that's kind of where you know having an understanding of not only what you have, but what's inside of what you have really matters. Yeah, that's the thing I was talking about earlier with, you know, that's what the DOD kind of has locked down to where, you know, they they can they can afford a little bit more time to remediate things because that's something that they're extremely aware of from the get go is they you know and that's part of why procurement processes are such a nightmare with with the government you know is they want to know everything right um and for that very reason and it's a very hard thing to do um you know the log for j one and spring for shell uh, those impacted like jira. Atlassian, you know, Jira, uh, Atlassian software has a ton of Java libraries in it and some open uh, enterprise uh, ERP uh, type softwares, right? So anytime you get a vulnerability with those, you can pretty much guarantee that any other system that's integrated with is, is going to be vulnerable too. Um, now, here's kind of a good question, and, and, and Joshua, if you have some insights in here, you know, how do you get better at that, right? Like, I mean, there's the obvious approach of sitting there and, and, and grilling people, but not everybody's going to show you the sausage, right? So um, there's there's other ways other than going directly to the source, but, you know, what are some of your recommendations? If you have any, what have you seen done? It really comes down to understanding that uh, what your supply chain is, what's responsible for all the pieces and parts that you have in your organization, you know, what they are and, you know, what tools you might get off the shelf that can tell you what they might not be telling you. Yeah, and I think that, that integrated, um, like the intelligence too, right? You can you can see a lot of activity that can kind of give you some clues. And now on, on the other side, you know, doing this from a red teaming perspective, that's exactly what we do to find out what what vulnerabilities you have out there. Um, and uh, we'll take that as another opportunity to say, get your stuff tested, right? Pen testing is, is kind of a huge answer to the vis visibility on this stuff as well. Um, you know, you've you've got your scanner, you've got your patcher, you've got your MDR, and how do you know all this stuff works? 
uh, you get some get some black hat guys in there, some red teamers to go mess it all up um, and see if it works. Because um, <clears throat> you know, like like endpoint stuff. I mean, we've got it enabled in a lot of customer environments, and you know, I've seen it not stop me from doing anything. So you know, they're wasting money on stuff like that. Um, and keeping track of your inventories, right? I think inventory management is really bad. I've never seen anybody with a really good inventory of software. All right, a lot of great points in this uh, conversation. I really, really do appreciate both of you taking the time to uh, walk through all of this and talk through. Um, any final thoughts before we, we end it here? Closing thoughts? AI is coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. AI ML is going to be the uh, the new threat vector. Mm. Yeah, that's what LinkedIn tells me anyways. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much again for your time.